Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the first in the series of webinars that carbon and energy professionals are putting on in conjunction with the Gen Less program. Uh, my name is Mike Hopkins. I'm Chief Executive of Carbon and Energy Professionals. Uh, but the good news is you won't have to listen to me for very long. I'm merely doing some introductions. We have today with us um, Ben Thompson and Paul Farrelly of Lumen. Uh, they are expert in their energy consultants and expert in the areas of helping uh, organizations and businesses reduce their energy bills, both through using less energy in the first place um, and actually then following on from that, paying less for the energy that is still used. Uh, so I just wanted to, to have a brief introduction uh, to everybody at the moment. Um, to remind people, I think, that we do have a conference coming up. Our conference is scheduled for June and we will be putting something on uh, on digital platforms uh, to replace our physical conference that you all know will likely have been cancelled by now, uh, but we will be doing that in early June. So please keep the dates of 9th, 10th and 11th of June free, uh, certainly the mornings of them. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, of course, is that we run uh, training programs in energy efficiency and carbon reduction and carbon management. Uh, those programs are still running. Uh, we've had to readjust the dates on a couple uh, and we've shifted those as well to digital delivery. But uh, please bear in mind that they are still available and take a look at our website to, to check the dates for that and whether or not we can help you reduce your energy use, uh, your bills, and also uh, contribute to, to reductions. So uh, enough from me, I think. So what I'd like to do now is pass you over to Ben. Um, and ex Ben can talk to you uh, reasonably more knowledgeably than me, I suspect, about the actual practicalities of reducing those energy bills and those carbon emissions. So, Ben, I shall pass over to you now. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to... Sh I can't share the screen now. Uh, it's not giving me the option. Yeah, you should have that now because... Oh, no. Some, <laughs> <laughs> we've actually just managed to give the option to Alison. Alison has joined <laughs> us and, and fallen off my list somehow <laughs> and got clicked as the, as the presenter. Uh, so I am going to revisit that and yeah. make sure that you now, Ben, are the presenter. There you go. And enjoy the next hour of Ben's expertise, please, everyone. All right. Can we see the slideshow um, or are we looking at me? Just making sure I've got the right screen on. I can see you. We have the slideshow and you, Ben. Fantastic. Cool. All right. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, so just a few introductions before we get started. I'm Ben. Um, I lead the energy and carbon team at Lumen. I've been working in the industry for close to a decade now, helping our clients reduce their energy costs and achieve carbon reduction goals. The energy and carbon team at Lumen has been around for about 15 years. Um, we used to be called Enercon until late last year, so you might know us under that name. And we work with a wide range of clients, so in the commercial space, airports, local and central government, universities, um, and in the industrial space, it's in the wood, meat and dairy sectors mainly. We offer a wide range of services and they can be broken into four main categories. So the first category is around analysing and this includes things like feasibility studies, energy audits and carbon footprints. And it's essentially looking at what is the current situation and what are your best options or opportunities for improvement. The second category is around planning, and so this is development of decarbonisation roadmaps, energy management plans, and it's essentially setting targets and then planning um, how, you, how you're going to achieve those targets. The third category is around implementation, so this is business case development and project delivery, essentially getting stuff done, getting projects implemented. And lastly, we've got our monitor and optimise services, so that's around sub-metering, continuous building tuning, industrial systems optimization and that's around continuous improvement and long-term gains in the energy and carbon space. So I'll now hand over to Paul. He's going to introduce himself and he'll take us through the first part of the webinar. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. I hope everybody is doing okay in their in their bubble. Um, so yeah, my my name is Paul Farrelly. I have been like Ben in the energy industry for ten years, almost 10, 10 years to the day, actually. Uh, most of my experience has been in terms of working at Meridian Energy. So I used to head up the uh, managed accounts team there, which is responsible for uh, commercial, corporate, and agribusiness clients, and looked after the account management team and the, the tender desk. So I think I've probably been responsible for about 5,000 pricing responses over my uh, my time at Meridian. So I guess my expertise really is around the pay less part of the equation, whereas Ben and the, the team are more on that use less side. So it's great to be able to bring the, the two parts together. Um, if we just skip on to the next slide. So what we're going to cover off today, now we've got um, a really kind of broad um, audience on the on the call today. So we're going to try and cater to, I guess, all, all tastes and all levels of um, expertise in this topic. Um, so hopefully there's going to be something that's relevant for everybody that's on the call. Um, what we think, it's, it's uh, obviously we're dealing with the COVID-19 situation at the moment and um, it's, a, it's a major health issue, but also a major economic issue. And I think the latest stats are that it's around 85,000 businesses have claimed the wage subsidy, which affects about 1.6 million um, employees. So we think in the current environment, um, we can hopefully add some value to businesses by you know, demonstrating some ways and some, some tools you can use to cut your costs quickly when it comes to your energy bills. So that's what we're really gonna focus on today initially. And then Ben's gonna to touch on some of the quick win energy efficiency improvements. A lot of energy efficiency um, has a, a longer payback, so investing to, to get savings in the future. Uh, but there are some things that can be achieved um, really quickly as well. And I just just uh, to go back to Mike mentioned, this is the first in a series of webinars through CEP and ECA. Um, so, we're the, we're the first cab off the rank, which is great. I think there's going to be four more webinars. The one next week is on energy procurement. So whilst that's a topic very dear to my heart, I'm not going to wax on too much about that today because that's next week. And I think the other topics are still being confirmed, but I believe there'll be one on solar as well. Um, in terms of questions, I think you can post questions on the, on the panel there somewhere. Uh, we'll endeavour to keep an eye on those questions as they come through. And hopefully we have a bit of time at the end to answer those. If any really great questions come up, during the presentation, either Ben or I might step in and interrupt the other one to, to ask that particularly uh, interesting question. All right, so let's get into it. Can you drive it? Yeah, thank you. So the first thing we're going to look at today is around optimising your energy charges. So um, the first place to start really is to basically is to review and check your bills and look at the various elements that make up your bill. Um, one of the things I'm constantly surprised with in, in what I do is actually talking to some really large businesses and asking them if they understand what's actually on the energy bill and do they know what they're paying for and quite often the answer is no. Um, we just assume it's okay and we pay the bill. So there's, there's definitely an, edu uh, an education opportunity out there, as I say, for some of the larger businesses as well. So being able to read your bill and interpret your charges is a really good place to start. Um, there's also some really good information that you can get from your retailer. Um, you can get uh, half hourly data if you have a smart meter or a time of use meter. And in some cases, they have really good, really good online portals. So you can use those to start assessing when you're using power. So when you're using power is a really, really critical thing to understand and to look at. Um, investigate the various tariff options that are available for your particular site. There's often uh, more than one tariff option available. And quite, you can make quite, quite quick savings sometimes if you have a tariff which isn't optimised. Um, particularly if you have lots of sites, this has been a really good exercise to work through. And if you've moved into a building recently or your usage pattern has changed, the, um, the tariff option will be based on the, the previous use. So it is something that's worth reviewing um, reasonably frequently. And the last thing, and often we see some really, really good opportunities here, particularly in the larger part of the market, is around optimising your network charges. So by network, we mean lines company. So that's in Auckland, that's Vector, Christchurch, it's Orion and different network companies around the country. Um, there's a whole lot of different charges that can come through on your bill, depending on where you are. Things like peak load or demand, capacity and power factor are all things that you can typically do something about and reduce. And in some cases, network charges can actually make up around 50% of your bill. So it's really, really important that you understand what those are. Um, those charges just get passed through from your retailer. 
So they appear on your bill, even though they relate to the network company. Thanks, Ben. So what we're going to do is we're going to work through a couple of examples um, just to sort of provide some information around bills and the different things you can do with different types of sites. And these are just a couple of uh, clients that we're working with at the moment. So the first one here, this is a um, what's called a non-time of use site. So most, most sites are, are going to be of this nature, uh, non-time of use. So basically, um, primary schools, four squares, uh, most retail stores, um, at all residential sites will fall under this category. So this is the, the vast majority of sites are going to be of this type. So the bill is actually quite straightforward. You're really looking at a energy charge, which is everything bundled together. So your energy charges, your network or lines company charges are bundled in together and the, um, and the kilowatt hours. So how much power you're using. So um, in this sort of context, you have really low fixed charges. So if you were looking at forecasting the impact of COVID-19 on these type of sites, you'd expect to see if your usage has dropped away, your costs are going to drop right away as well because there's very few or low fixed charges. And in this case, so this is a school boarding house, we notice that they're on an any time or flat rate. So it's the same rate applies throughout the day. So the first question we sort of asked was, well, okay, boarding house, does that, does that make sense? So what we need to do, the next thing we look at is uh, on the next page, is the usage profile. So what we've done now, the data that we get from the retailer is reasonably useful. And in this case, the retailer has a pretty good portal, um, but it doesn't really tell us a whole lot. So we, we, we can extract the data from the retailer and look at power usage um, in a series of different ways. So the one, one I like to start with is a view where you look at the um, power usage over the course of a day. So the um, horizontal axis here is basically starting from um, uh, midnight and going through to midnight, so across a day, and we're looking at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we're looking at each of the days. So we can we spot a few things here. So in this particular case, what we observed is a really, really large peak of energy load occurring in the evening and continuing through until um, early in the morning. So um, we've modelled and looked at whether or not the anytime tariff that they're on is in fact the best or if the day-night option, which um, is available in this particular network, would be better. And um, if we flick on there, Ben, we can see that in this particular case, they can make around a $5,000 saving just by changing the tariff. And the cost to do that is going to be in the order of a couple of hundred bucks. So pretty good payback on that um, on that change. So this particular school, actually, it's um, it's got about 13 sites in total. And we think three of them, or well, three of them, we can change the tariff to get pretty immediate savings. So you get a really, really good um, impact there with um, with little investment. We've also done a, a quick walkthrough audit on this one, and that's identified a few things that we can do um, simply from the, I guess, the use less side of the equation. So the fan heaters going on with no controls, the showers that don't have flow restrictions, and there's underfloor heating which is operational during school holidays. So we can make some significant energy savings here just by. Uh, changing a few things. And we've managed to work that out by using the energy data to inform our walkthrough audit and then making these observations. So next uh, example, this is a little bit more complicated. So this is a um, small manufacturer up in Auckland. This is a time of use bill. So if you're a, a large, if your site's a larger power user, you'll typically find that it's got this type of um, pricing structure. So on the left-hand side are all the rates that apply. So time of use is basically there's different rates that apply at different times. So um, different times of the day, different rates apply. And the network charges here are itemised and um, provided on the bill. And in this case, it's a bit hard to see it probably on the screen, but we have identified on the right-hand side, we've got a network capacity charge, a demand charge and a power factor. One of the observations is that the capacity that this site has, and they pay a fixed amount to have the ability to draw a certain amount of load from the network, is far greater than what they actually require. So we can actually work with the retailer and the network company to effectively give them less, less capacity, um, which they don't require. So we make an immediate saving there. We've also identified they have a power factor issue. So I'm not going to get into the the real details of power factor, just I'll just say it's a, basically it's a measure of how effectively the energy is basically used on your site. If you have a poor power factor, it means that you're really in, you're really inefficient and you're paying a whole lot more than you should, and you can actually rectify that 
really quickly. So in this case, <clears throat> just by looking at the bill, we've actually managed to spot some really, really good savings opportunities without even going on site or doing any analysis. So there are, are some good opportunities um, out there. We just flick on to the next one. So this is the same sort of view that we showed for the boarding house. And it just, again, just shows you, this one's a bit, bit of a cleaner profile. It's a bit more of a standard kind of um, nine to five type operation. <clears throat> Obviously pretty low power use overnight, peaks during the day. This one's pretty constant throughout the day and then it drops away. So we're interested in exploring a little bit about that Saturday um, power use because they only operate from nine to 12, yet the power is up um, at, a, at an elevated level until around four o'clock in the afternoon. The other thing we observe on this one that there is a, a reasonable amount of bus load energy. So that's just constant energy that's being drawn from the network and we want to understand why that's occurring and what, what we might be able to do to reduce that. So if we can reduce that base load, that will apply 24 seven and we can get some pretty good um, energy savings out of that as well. Um, so the recommendations on that one, installing power factor correction equipment, reducing the capacity. The other thing that we're just gonna to touch on a little bit is they're contracted until the end of January at this stage and they're, in, <clears throat> they're actually on quite a high price because when they signed their contract, the um, energy market prices were actually quite high. So they're locked in at the moment on a, on a price which is pretty high and it's only locked in till the end of January. With the um, COVID-19, what we've seen is a significant decrease in the prices in the energy market. Um, <clears throat> just looking before actually, there's a the energy futures market. So you can trade energy futures in New Zealand and that's a pretty good indication of where the market predicts pricing is going to go. And it's also how the retailers price large users as they use this um, electricity futures market or ASX. So just looking at the um, the price or the, the assumed pricing for the next quarter, um, about a month ago, it was sitting at 11.6 cents. This is the wholesale energy price. That's dropped, the projected price for the, the average of the quarter that we're in now drops from 11.6 to 6.6 .6 cents. So <clears throat> that's a huge reduction um, in energy pricing. So what that means is that potentially you might have some um, opportunities if you've got a contract which is ending soon to potentially talk to your retailer and see if they're prepared to renegotiate a longer term contract in exchange for um, taking some uh, or reduction or reducing the price in the short term which could really help with with cash flow and the last thing we mentioned there was reducing base load consumption so last thing i'm going to talk about um, in the section is around getting a better deal or, or paying less so as i say electricity prices have changed dramatically due to COVID 19 if you're in the middle of a contract <laughs> it might be worth engaging your retailer um, they may well be pre prepared to renegotiate. Certainly in my time at Meridian, um, we would we would occasionally look at, um, at renegotiating mid-contract, generally in exchange for a longer term. And given the market that we're in at the moment, there might be opportunities there. If you have smaller sites, um, you might have some break fees associated with those sites. And those break fees can be quite low, often, often be very, very low. So, Again, there may be opportunities to get a better deal in the current market than what you currently have. And if you have a small break fee, um, hey, it might it might be um, economically worth your while to actually look at a changing provider um, midway through the contract, if, if that's something you want to look at. I wouldn't normally suggest that, but you know, in these these are unprecedented times, and if um, <clears throat> cutting some energy costs allows your business to to survive or get through without having to um, to lose staff, then I certainly think we should be doing everything we can to try and make, make energy savings. If you are gonna to go to market, make sure you engage a reputable consultant. Um, it is actually <laughs> a lot more to energy procurement than might meet the eye. Um, I would be very wary of any consultants that do a percentage savings type basis just in the current market. Generally, I think a consultant that offers a fixed fee service is probably a, a better bet for you, but you know, and there may be others that are offering a risk reward type approach. Um, I'll just be a little bit wary about that. And the last point is just be wary of any group purchasing. So if someone approaches you and says, we're gonna get you a great deal by going in as part of like a buying group, that may not be the case. Excuse me. We'd often get approached that um, 
at Meridian by um, consultants and, and others kind of putting together like a bulk deal, which would work in most other categories, like if you're buying photocopiers or things like that, if you're going to sell a thousand photocopiers, you give a better price, but it doesn't really work that way in energy. We would, as a retailer, we'd look at individuals in a group as individual entities, particularly if they're larger enterprises, and we'd offer individual or bespoke pricing to each of those enterprises anyway. So <clears throat> you're unlikely to get a better deal by going in as part of a, a buying group. What you might do though, is you might get a lower cost of procurement by bundling your tender in with others. So just something to be wary of. Um, and if you need any assistance on this front, this is an area that we um, we specialize in as well. So um, we'd love to help you out. And if we can help a business to cut its costs and save some employees, then um, that would be a great outcome. Um, we'd, we'd love to do that. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Ben. And oh, thanks so, Paul. so this is gonna be a pretty high level run through the second part where we look at some <laughs> common quick win energy efficiency improvements. Um, and we'll talk about some of the stuff we see in our work with some real world examples. You could do an entire webinar or even a series sorry, of webinars on some of these topics. Yeah, sorry, sorry Ben, to interrupt you briefly. Um, I have noticed we've had a couple of questions in and uh, oh, yeah. I'll take responsibility. I should have said up front uh, whether or not we were dealing with questions as we went through or um, during the course of the event. So that's my fault. Sure. Um, but just to alert you to the fact that there are a couple of questions. There, I don't know if you'd like to take those now or whether or not you would like to leave them, but I'll, I'll hand back to you and uh, close my mic off. Yeah, sure. I think we might just address them at the end unless Paul, unless something really relevant comes up, Paul, just, just flip them through um, and yeah. we'll, we'll un unmute people's mics and let them ask the questions themselves. So we should be done in the next 15 minutes. I can tell you the first three were in regards to not having shared the slides, so we can, I think we can check those ones <laughs> off. So now um, those. But yeah, if anything really cool pops up, I'll, um, I'll, I'll interject. Thanks, yeah, Mike. Sounds good. Cool. So as I mentioned, um, we'll be, just be scratching the surface on, on some of these topics. If you've got any questions, like Mike just said, um, fire them through and we'll, we'll try and get to them. If, you, if we don't get to them and you still want to have a chat with them, just get in touch after the webinar and we're, we're happy to talk through them with you. But most of the opportunities that we'll look at have paybacks in the order of months. So they're ideal for reducing your energy costs fast in this current economic climate. Some do require a little bit of capital up front. Um, there are options out there for potentially having a third party fund to come in, pay for those, and then you pay it off with savings over time. So just because there's a little bit of capital involved doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do it. So the first one we'll look at is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems and building management systems. So if you look after a commercial building or a portfolio of commercial buildings, then you'll definitely have some HVAC systems throughout your sites. Um, and if you've got a larger building, you might also have what's called a building management system, and that controls the HVAC system. In a typical commercial building, HVAC makes up well over half the energy consumption typically, um, and it's actually most likely to be quite a big part of your carbon emissions because you often have a fossil fuel boiler plant. And HVAC is where we always find heaps of opportunities in commercial buildings, particularly when there's a building management system. So here's three tips that we always come across. The number one thing we always find is that some equipment is operating when it's not required. So we recommend that you're regularly checking your schedules to make sure they are matching the actual requirements. This can be done on local controllers like the heat pump um, controller on the left there, or through your building management system on the computer um, on that image on the right there. So during normal times when we're not having a um, crazy COVID times, a good regular review of HVAC scheduling can, um, every six months or so, can save, easily save, one to two percent of total energy costs. Um, and this is a really simple thing to do. It can take, you know, half an hour to an hour to do. Remember to include public holidays when you're reviewing your schedules. They make up three percent of the year, which is pretty significant. Um, and Anzac Day is going to be observed next Monday. So I guarantee a lot of buildings around New Zealand will operate as if it's a normal Monday. During lockdown, checking scheduling has become even more important, and we've helped some of our clients reduce their building energy consumption by 70, 80%. And that's really important at the moment when they're trying to cut costs with, with no revenue. It seems like these changes to building occupancy are probably gonna stick around for a decent chunk of this year, so we're recommending that people start reviewing their scheduling sort of on a monthly basis. 
And regarding COVID, you can switch your HVAC off entirely if your building is unoccupied or areas of your building are unoccupied. However, however we recommend that you run some equipment um, every, you know, once or twice or one or two hours a week. Jackson's Engineering has done a really good guide or free guide on this that they've um, put up on their website. So I'd recommend checking that out if you're looking to go down that path. So for larger buildings, when you've got a more complex HVAC system and a building management system, the two most common issues we come across that waste a lot of energy are outside air control and leaky heating and cooling valves. So you'll, you need to bring in some outside air into a building to provide adequate ventilation for the people in there. Um, however, most buildings are bringing in excessive amounts of outside air and it's really expensive to heat and cool. The most common issues that we see that cause this are faulty CO2 sensors, which um, can be used to determine how much ventilation you need, and broken outside air dampers. I recently heard someone say that there's two types of outside air dampers, broken and about to break, and that's right on the money from our perspective from what we've seen. So to check for the stuff, you can do a quick scan on the BMS to check for faulty CO2 sensors. A good start is to see which sensors aren't reading between 400 and 500 parts per million when the building's empty. That means they're likely faulty. Um, you can trend them over time and see if they're changing. Often they get stuck or if they're, if they're well below or well outside the normal ranges and you've got an issue. And this doesn't just necessarily relate to energy consumption. If you've got a CO2 um, sensor that's reading really low, you won't be bringing enough outside air, so it becomes a comfort issue as well. And you can check dampers by driving them open and close on the BMS and going to the equipment and seeing what actually happens. Do they actually open and close fully? Optimizing outside air control and fixing leaky heating and cooling valves can save 10, 20, even 30% of building energy consumption. And the costs, they should be included in your maintenance budget, but we're only talking a few thousand dollars often. Um, I've got a really good example on the next slide. So this is an air handling unit for one of our clients where I managed to find the trifecta. So you can't tell from the image, but this was operating during the middle of the night when no one was there. So that, that was number one. Um, you can see, if you look at the, the outside air temperature, OAT, it's bringing in 10 degree outside air, 100% outside air. It's passing over a coil that's supposed to be shut at 0% and it's heating up to 21 degrees. So not only are we bring in 100% outside air for no one in the building, we're also heating it up and wasting a lot of energy that way. It's interesting to note though that the temperature uh, in the space is 21.4 degrees and the set point is 20.5. So if there was someone in that space, they wouldn't actually notice and they'd, they'd be having a pretty good time. So unless you're reviewing this stuff regularly, um, you're not necessarily getting complaints for this stuff and you won't pick it up. Over the whole site, this is happening quite a bit. Um, it was costing them around 100 grand a year and changing schedules and fixing valves and dampers Again, it was included in their maintenance budget. It's probably a few thousand dollars to go through and do it all. Um, so a real no-brainer. So in addition to those three common big issues, there's hundreds and hundreds of typical faults and opportunities that we find with building management systems. And it gets pretty complex. So here's just a quick plug for one of our new services, uh, which we're calling Building Tuning with BMS Data Analytics. So this slide shows the summary dashboard for our BMS data analytics platform that we're starting to roll out with a few of our clients. It's a relatively new development in New Zealand, um, but it's a really effective way of continuously finding those hundreds and probably thousands of faults in some buildings um, and those improvement opportunities in HVAC systems. It works by analyzing data on a live basis or polling data sort of every one or two minutes. And it just runs rules that we set up that we know will find faults. So in the real simple case, uh, it'll say, is the equipment operating when it should be? If not, flag it and let me know so I can do something about it. In a slightly more complex case, the rule could ask, is the air temperature rising over a, a heating coil when the heating coil is supposed to be shut? So like we were talking about before. If so, let me know that it's happening. Um, we can input data around the size of the system in there so it can tell us roughly how much it's, gonna, it's costing us. And then we can make a decision to, to go out and fix it. We're finding it's a lot better than um, doing one-off reviews every couple of years, which is sort of what we're doing in, in the 2000s and 2010s, um, because we can cover a lot more ground every minute of the day throughout the entire year. And some of the benefits we're seeing so far is 10 to 20% energy savings. Um, we could do that in the past, but now we're maintaining them long-term, so you don't get an increase in energy consumption after the um, project's been implemented. It's also changing the way that maintenance is done. 
So instead of checking 100% of the stuff um, that's working, maintenance is now targeted on the 5%, say, uh, of stuff that we know is likely broken. And we're just getting a lot better visibility in terms of uh, occupant comfort, discomfort, um, and also better visibility on what, on what contractors and consultants are doing for the client. And it's also really coming into its own with this COVID-19 shutdowns. We can see we get a really good um, overlook of, of what's happening in the facility and, and what can be switched off. There's a few companies offering these solutions now. Uh, we use SkySpark as the back-end data analytics engine for ours. And it's had seven years of R&D, so it's, it's really humming along nicely, well, uh, nicely now. And we've got about 200 standard rules, and we've got the ability to do customizable rules as well. And just a final note on this, we are able to amortize the cost of, of the service over time to avoid the large upfront costs that people don't want right now. Cool, moving hey, on ben, to lighting. Just, so, ben, yeah. just gonna jump in. So I've got a question here just, just before you get into lighting, so it might be the one sure. to address as you go through. Um, someone here is interested in hearing about lighting controls. They say their office lights are on until the last cleaner comes through in the evening, which is between 9 and 10.30 p.m. Uh, although yep. most staff have left the building by around 5, 5.30. Probably a common Perfect. situation, that one. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So timers are pretty easy to install to, to control um, lighting and or occupancy sensors. And then there's the good old staff education. So nominating someone that's responsible for switching off the lights at the end of the day. So there's quite a few options there. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, when I go through the lighting. Lighting's one of those most common uses, and you know most sites have some form of lighting, regardless of, of what type of facility they are. It could be well over half of the energy consumption for say a distribution warehouse, maybe 10 to 20% for a commercial building, right down to less than 5% for an industrial manufacturing plant. Um, so the number one, and it's coming back to that question, is to switch off the lights. Um, I actually cringed when I put this into the presentation. It's probably the oldest, um, simplest energy efficiency tip in the book. And there's people, you know, with a lot greater hair than me that have been banging on about it for years. But if you if you walk around, say, Wellington City, um, reasonably late at night, you'll still see that most buildings are lit up like Christmas trees. So the message isn't quite getting through. Um, so referring back to using your that freely available energy data as well, if you have high overnight load, there's a good chance that a decent chunk of this is lighting that's been left on. So in terms of a few tips, um, number one is do a night visit at your site and see what's left on. And don't let people know that you're gonna come to the site to have a look, because they might switch the lights off just for you. As I mentioned before, you can ensure someone's responsible for switching off lights at the end of the day, or install automatic controls for large areas. So that's things like occupancy sensors, um, timers as well, is one way of doing it. Make sure those automatic controls are actually working. Um, we've had some instances with one of our airport clients, for example, where they've got a whole terminal of lighting that's set up on the BMS to run um, on schedules. And what we found is that they'd left the um, controls in manual mode on the switchboard. So the BMS was telling it to the lighting to switch on and off, but it just it wasn't working, so they were staying on 24-7. And that was tens of thousands of, of dollars wasted. Um, and it was a simple fix, just flicking flicking um, those switches from manual to auto so the BMS could control them. Our second tip is to replace old lights with LEDs. Um, focus on the really inefficient ones right now if, if you're strapped for cash. Um, and those are those are ones like metal halides that you can see in the pictures here, sodium vapors, halogens, um, anything that's giving out a lot of heat generally is a good way to test if it's energy if it's inefficient. Um, LED, if you're replacing these types of lights with LEDs, you can get a 50% reduction in energy consumption. They last way longer, two to three times longer, and they give you way better lights. So they're just better in every single way. The payback on these, if you've got these types of inefficient lights and they're running for say half the year, you can probably get a payback of around two years when you when you also incorporate the maintenance savings with the energy savings. Um, and as I mentioned before, there can be a bit of an upfront cost but there are options out there for third party funding um, and you pay off with savings over time. Cool, compressed air. So compressed air is a really expensive um, for, uh, service and all compressed air systems have some leakage that costs a lot. A good compressed air system can maintain leakage, uh, leakage rate of less than 10%, but we've seen bad sites that have you know, over half of the, the air compressor energy is servicing leaks. There's a few, way to, a few ways to identify leaks. The first one is just listening. So if you switch off all the, 
loud equipment in a, in a factory, for example, and just have a listen for hissing, that's a really good indicator as to whether you've got um, significant air leaks. And that can sort of give you an idea. You can, you can find big leaks and you can also get an idea of how bad the situation is. The second option is to do an ultrasonic leak detection survey. And that, that's really the, one of the best ways to do it. You can commission a contractor or you can get a, an ultrasonic leak detection um, leak detector yourself and do it yourself. Um, but most likely you'll commission a contractor to go around the system, um, basically finding where the leaks are. Make sure you actually fix the leaks. The contractor will tag those leaks when they find them and give you a report telling you telling you what it's worth. But we've been on a lot of sites where um, they haven't actually fixed the, the leaks and the tags are still there from say, you know, 2016. The other option is to turn off any compressed air um, required, or any equipment that requires compressed air and just leave the compressor going. Um, you may need a sub meter it to see what the load is um, while you've got no load on it. Or some of the newer compressors have got screens that you can actually see what the load is. Um, and this is the example we've got on this graph here. So uh, in terms of the orange line, that is before. And you can see during the middle of the night, they're pulling 60 kilowatts. Um, and that's, that means that there's huge leakage going on in this site. So we've got a, an ultrasonic leak detection survey done. Uh, they picked up a whole bunch of leaks, including a really large underground leak, and they fixed the leaks, and that's where you see the blue line. So that's afterwards. Once they've fixed the leaks overnight, you can see the loads dropped from 60, say, kilowatts down to about 10. So a 50 kilowatt saving in terms of leaks, which is massive. And this was this was saved them around about 40 grand a year. This also shows the value of energy submetering. If you were just looking at the site in terms of the retail meter, then you'd never see this. It would just be noise in, in the whole site. And like all things with energy management, you should be doing regular reviews of compressed air leakage. So every six or 12 months, you should be doing an ultrasonic leak detection survey and try and maintain that leakage um, amount under 10%. Cool, second to last um, end use is process heat. And process heat is basically any energy that's used in the form of steam, hot water, hot gases, and it can be for industrial processing, um, it can be for heating rooms and spaces, all sorts of different things. Most sites, regardless of their type, have a decent chunk of process heat, and it, it often, again, makes up a, a good chunk of their energy consumption and costs, but also a really big chunk of their carbon emissions because a lot of process heat is, is generated through fossil fuels. The first thing we always recommend is to assess the steam and hot water use. Where's it going? How much is being used? Um, do we actually need that much? A good example is meat processing plants. I think we've got a few few guys from meat processing plants here today. We've often found that uh, knife steriliser hot water flow rates are three, four, five times what they need to be. Hot water wash down hose flow rates are two to three times what they need to be to do the job effectively. And these are relatively easy things to measure. Um, it can often reduce the heat load by 10, 20%. The second tip is to make sure your boiler has been tuned to run at the lowest excess air required to still maintain complete combustion. You can often pick up one to 3% improvement in combustion efficiency through regular combustion tuning. Again, it's one of those ones between six and 12 months generally. Uh, and the last thing is to insulate any exposed pipework, particularly steam pipework. Uh, it's not only an energy issue, but also health and safety risk. It's pretty easy to burn yourself on an exposed steam pipe. Uh, and also fix any steam or hot water leaks. Again, not just an energy issue, but you'll also be reducing your water consumption and your water treatment costs. You can get a huge amount of benefit out of these relatively basic systems optimization tools. Um, we've got a really good example with a client um, last year. So the client came to us with a problem. They had three boilers, three coal boilers, um, one big coal boiler and two small coal boilers. And the consents for the two small boilers are running out at the end of the, end of the um, 2019 and so they said to us we need to find a replacement for those ideally some low carbon options and we decided hold on a sec let's see if we can reduce reduce the consumption first so using the three tips on this slide we've now got to the point where they can actually meet the steam load with that one large coal boiler so the site's using way less coal than it was before they didn't have to stump up any capital to replace those two small boilers um, because they don't need them anymore and they're also now in a much better position to start decarbonising or continue decarbonising with new tech because now they've got rid of all that energy wastage, any new technology they put in will be a lot smaller and a lot more cost effective. You can do this stuff in-house, um, however we, we find that an external look can be quite effective 
um, because consultants come in with no preconceived ideas. So um, a lot of the staff on these on these sites have been there for many, many years and they, they can only see one way of how the system operates. So um, it can be a bit hard for them to see the forest through the trees. So sometimes it is good to have an external look. Um, and just a quick note that for anyone who's really interested in decarbonising process heat, we're going to be doing another webinar in a couple of weeks um, specifically focused on commercial buildings. Last but certainly not just, least. Uh, just, I'm just going to jump in here with just a comment that's come through from uh, from Blair, um, just around yep. um, compressor, uh, compressor, yeah, air dryers attached to air compressors can waste a lot of energy if they're not operating efficiently or cycling off correctly when not required. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and the bigger the system gets, the more uh, ancillary equipment you have. So you don't just focus on the. You take a systems approach and look at the uh, the air compressor, but there's obviously some ancillary equipment that should be looked at at the same time. And yeah, Blair's completely right. That they can waste a lot of energy as well. Cool. So refrigeration. It's a really complex topic. Um, this is one of those ones you could definitely do a series of webinars on. So we we will just be scratching the surface. Um, but it, in the first the first opportunity in a refrigeration system, a compressor is used to compress and heat up a gas. So that can then be used to transfer heat out of the refrigerated space, and that's usually to atmosphere. Um, and often the pressure set point that that compressor is compressing to is a lot higher than what's actually required for the system to run effectively, and it can be reduced. The compressor power requirement is then reduced. You have a little bit of a penalty on your fan power from your cooling towers, but most often the overall result is a significant reduction in power consumption to the tune of 5-10% sometimes. Um, it's a particularly relevant one now as we come into winter. Outside air temperatures are dropping so you can reduce those condensing pressures. Um, and often it's just a change of a set point so it's a, it can be a pretty easy opportunity. And also effective maintenance and staff education, uh, they're essential for really minimising refrigeration energy consumption. And that's things like maintaining cool room door seals in good working order to minimise um, air leakage, ensuring all heat exchanges in the units are, are not fouled and they're, they're well cleaned, that maximises heat transfer and energy efficiency, educating staff about minimising the amount of time cold room doors are left open, and lastly, effective air purging of refrigerant lines. That means that you've got minimal air uh, mixing with the refrigerant, which again helps with heat transfer. Cool, so just some final thoughts before we go to questions. Uh, we appreciate COVID-19 as, as front of mind for a lot of us right now, and businesses are struggling. So we, we hope you have been able to pick up a few tips, even one or two tips that you can apply to your business to reduce costs. We also think it's really important we don't forget the bigger picture though. So climate change is very much happening, uh, still happening. Um, and in a way, COVID-19 is the perfect opportunity to start planning for a low emissions future. COVID's already caused so much change in our lives, um, how we work, how we travel or don't travel, how we operate buildings and plants. So we may as well jump on this momentum of change with our climate change efforts too. Um, and there's some really good eco funding out there now to, to get some of that stuff done. So thanks a lot for your attendance. And we can probably go to a few questions now if you've been monitoring it, Paul. Yep, <laughs> some interesting ones here. Um... I'm not sure I can answer this, but I'll read it out anyway. Any thoughts on the longer term implications of working from home on the traditional Bactrian camel profile of daily electricity use? So I guess what that means is that uh, traditionally you have a peak uh, power usage in the morning and a peak power usage again in the evening when you have kind of businesses and homes both using power at the same time. Um, I guess we would probably have some good insights on that from the power usage over the last four weeks as people have been working from home. And I think from what I understand, it's a much flatter profile now than it was um, six weeks ago. So I think we will see a shift to more people working from home more regularly, even once we come out of this. So yeah, I think there will be some um, long-term uh, changes to to power use in New Zealand, or the, the profile of power use in New Zealand, which would be really, really interesting to, to see. I guess a good through. point as well is um, that free data, you can most often get it for your house as well. So if you're interested in, if you've got a bit of time on your hands at the moment, you can get free energy data for your house and, and see what's happening if you've got a smart meter. Um, so that could be an interesting little little project. Yep. Um, There's a question there about power factor equipment. What what are the options? You're probably more of an expert there than, than me, Ben. Yep. So power factor correction, uh, basically it's a bank of capacitors that essentially out, well, fights against the power factor by, by correcting it. 
um, they're installed you know alongside your electrical equipment it's a pretty pretty common and straightforward installation most sites will have power factor correction if they've got a decent amount of electric motors um, throughout the site so yeah it's a really common one can be really cost effective it depends a little bit on how your network charge uh, network company charges you sometimes you don't actually get penalized for power factor so again it's really important to understand how you're being charged if, if you're being charged for power factor how you're being charged and, and what the size of that charge is to to do the business case yeah i'll just say if anyone's got any power factor issues or want any advice on um where to go we've got some people we can point you in the direction of um, which we're happy to do uh we've got a little bit more around that lighting issue um so this is interesting so so the cleaners back to the cleaners um they are coming in one a lot of cleaners come in at six o'clock and do a bit of dusting and stuff go away and then the next lot of cleaners come in at 9 30 so in between sort of 6 30 and 9 30 no one in the building but the lights are on so yep. what would you suggest there i reckon occupancy sensors would be the the perfect one for that um, and it doesn't matter what time they come if they change the schedule slightly um, the lights will only come on when you've got an, an occupancy sensor yeah yep cool um Another one here. I've encountered power factor correction units that have failed, but the client has not been aware. That's not very good, is it? Suggest perhaps power factor correction is equipped with alarm ops. I guess so. Although generally, if your power factor is poor, um, some sort of energy management program or regular reporting would pick that up anyway using your retailer data. Um, so we can help anyone who needs to learn how to get that data from a retailer and and check it on a regular basis that's quite straightforward that's what i'd suggest rather than needing to necessarily put an alarm and just check your check your data that's that's quite a common issue though with power factor correction failing um often it can overheat as well we've had issues where the power factor correction was stopped working because it was getting too hot in the switchboard room um so yeah absolutely cool um okay what are the most affordable and easy occupancy sensors to install especially for misshapen rooms with corners and blind spots etc i'd recommend talk, talking to a lighting designer um yeah there's yeah. definitely people out there who know more about that than we do um we often just do the calculations and then get someone to design the best solution so there's, there's plenty of people out there that can help you with that cool and this is probably a trickier one to answer, and I've been I've been pondering this as, as it came through mid presentation. If we're it's a great one actually. <clears throat> if we're tenants in a building, how would you suggest we engage with the landlord to review the building energy usage that could lead to lower rent? <clears throat> it's an interesting one because actually there is evidence that suggests that if you have if you're a landlord and you have an energy efficient building, you can actually charge a higher rent. Um, as tenants are looking for green star buildings and the neighbours' ratings, which is a, a government. Uh, it's actually a New South Wales system which is coming into New Zealand, but it gives you a, a rating for your how energy efficient the building is. So certain uh, businesses are having policies around, you know, they'll only go into buildings that are rated as, above a certain level according to that system. So you won't necessarily get a rent reduction by having a more energy efficient um, building, but you certainly, um, you would, I would think that a landlord would be prepared to co-invest in energy efficiency um, even though you're probably likely to be the major beneficiary of that as a, as a tenant, um, but they may look to see something around a rent review at the end of that initial period. Um, we've got solar on the building at Lumen. Um, ben, you might want to just talk about that because our landlord came to the party on that. Yeah, that's a really good example of, of working together with the landlord. So our office in Christchurch, our lease was coming up for a new, uh, renewal and we asked the landlord, hey, would you um, pay for solar if we sign up for you know, a couple more years than, than you're expecting? And he said, yep, no worries. So um, it depends obviously on the market as to how, what the demand and supply is like, but annual landlord, um, some landlords are not willing to spend any money. Some are, some are a bit more willing to spend some money. So it's definitely possible. We've, we've done it at our building. They've put 10 kilowatts of solar on it and it's good for him um, in the future. He's gonna own the building for a long time. So it should encourage further people. And if we ever move out, it'll encourage other people to move in, so. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Here's a good one. I think there's a really good um, question here for you, Paul. Um, no, around no, the spot no. I'm, I'm dodging bullets, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so should oh, yeah, a large right. electricity consumer expose, them to, expose themselves mm -hmm. to the spot market cool. if they have the ability to pay uh, pay the bill of fixed rates and pay a slight premium? Mm. Um, well, that's a really, really tricky one to answer because the spot prices can jump around so dramatically 
that you need to be able to um, probably be able to cover maybe three to four times your average bill in any given month because of what can happen with with um, wholesale energy prices. So I'm not, I can't remember which month it was. It was towards the end, I think 2018, it was October or November from memory, where the average price across the month ended up being around 30 cents, when normally it would be around seven or eight. So it was four times higher than average. So that's the sort of volatility that you're going to, you can potentially be exposed to if you, uh, if you want to take up a spot option. So it really depends on your individual circumstances. So um, one of the things as a retailer we had to do, or still have to do, uh, retailers still do, is whenever you have a client that wants to take a spot product, they actually, you have to advise them about a stress test protocol that the electricity authority has developed. And the idea is that the business should actually run it, run through that exercise to, to ensure that they actually have um, the ability to, to cope with what can be a huge amount of volatility in, in a given month. Now, the, if you looked at it over, say, a three year period, would you be better off, you know, on a, would you be better off overall over three years on a spot contract or a fixed price contract? The answer is most probably you would pay less by being on a spot contract. But you can't guarantee that. So I think up to probably towards the end of 2018, um, over the previous seven or eight years, if you'd been on a spot contract, 95% of the time, it would have been better than being on a uh, fixed price. But if you were exposed in those periods during 2018, early 2019, chances are you would have paid more on spot than you would have on fixed. So um, it's a risky option. Um, so you need to look at the individual client and individual circumstances to determine what's best. I think if you can respond to um, short-term spikes in the market, you can do okay at a spot. You need to be able to react and respond and have controls that might respond to a high, high spot price. Um, but if you have an extended period of high spot pricing, then you know reducing your power probably isn't an option. So yeah, case by case, really. Cool. Uh, we've got another question here. Which device is cheaper to use, a uh, heat pump, heat pump heater, or a normal heater? Um, so a heat pump is around 300. You get about three units of energy out for every unit of electricity you put in, so it's about 300% efficient. Whereas a normal heater, you get one um, unit of energy, one unit of heat out for one unit of electricity put in. So definitely, a heat pump is the most efficient way to go. Um, and, and they're taking the world by storm at the moment. We're doing a lot of hot water heat pumps to replace um, boilers and things like that. So definitely heat pump technology. This is another good one for you, Paul. Is there a, any rule of thumb average kilowatt hours per day above that it's good to change from non half hourly to time of use? Yep, that's a great question. Uh, my rule of thumb would be if you are over five, not necessarily per day, but if I, I look at it per annum. Um, so over a year, if your site use say, more than 500,000 kilowatt hours, you're most likely going to be better off as time of use. So we used to we used to think, uh, probably four or five years ago, it was probably 250,000 to 300,000. It was better off being um, being time of use. But the way that the network charges have changed over time, it's a little bit more complicated to answer that question. But my rule of thumb, if you're over 500,000, you should be time of use. If you're under 250,000 should be nine half hour. If you're in the middle, in that corridor of uncertainty, then I would definitely be looking at um, exploring which option is best. And um, i give you an example of that. We had a project we ran in conjunction with a consultant when I was at Meridian with one of the fuel uh, companies, one of the petrol stations across the country. And we ended up working out at about half of the petrol stations and they all roughly used about the same amount of power. Half of them would be better off as time of use and half would be better as non half hourly. And it was very much a, um, a factor of what lines company those sites were in because each lines company has a different way of charging. So it's a really, really difficult one to give a definitive answer on, but hopefully that rule of thumb, just to recap, 250,000 or less non half hour, 500,000 or more TOU in the middle worth checking. Yeah, I guess it's just worth pointing out, you need to be really sure um, of your calculations for moving to time of use because you can get pinged pretty hard for demand charges, for example, and sometimes if you don't take that into account, then um, you end up on the wrong end of the ledger pretty easily. 
Yeah. Um, we've got quite a few questions from Blair Horrocks. Um, have you worked with Ice Bank Energy Storage for use in larger buildings? No, we haven't. I don't know if there's any in New Zealand. I know it's pretty popular in the States. Um, but yeah, it'd be a really interesting, really interesting um, way of doing it. Cool. I think that might be about it for questions, is it? Uh, there's one more from Terry. How straightforward is it to work out the economics of replacing a condensing gas boiler installed only three years ago with a hot water heat pump at a public pool? That's a, yeah, that's a really good one. Um, relatively straightforward. There's a few things you need to consider. Um, the, the thing that, obviously the heat pump is relatively expensive. The thing that can really get you is the electrical capacity um, increase required. And that's not just at the distribution, um, not just from the distribution transformer, but also in the local and in, inside the building. So you need to have, you need to talk to your network company first of all. Depending on what your capacity is, you might have enough capacity already, which would be really handy. If you don't have enough electrical capacity, talk to your network company. They'll be able to let you know how much it's going to cost to upgrade that capacity. It can be quite expensive depending on where it is. Um, and then you need a, a sparky to come around and look at your internals as well. If you've got the right size cables the right size switch gear, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that, that can be the real unknown in terms of costs. The heat pump itself, there's heaps of good manufacturers out there that can, that can give you pricing on that. Um, what else? In terms of temperature, you've got no issues because pool heating is pretty low temperature, so you can get really efficient um, heat pumps for that. And then in terms of the, the cost savings, you'd look at what, what are your gas um, bills now. Pretty much you could divide your energy consumption from your gas by about three, and that'll give you your um, kilowatt hours in electricity, and then you can figure out from that how much you'd pay in electricity. So it can be relatively complex, but um, pretty manageable. I'm not quite like this live chat thing, actually. I could get used to this. <laughs> it's been fun. Blair's throwing through some more good um, tips around defrost. Make sure you've got a clear coil, but also remember most types of defrost add heat to the room. That needs to be removed again. Huge energy waste and performance compromise if it's done wrong, absolutely. Um, there's definitely better ways to do defrost than just, say, electric resistive. How does the direct efficiency of the cold boiler change if we reduce the excess oxygen percentage? So as you reduce excess air, the efficiency improves to a certain point. Um, you need to maintain complete combustion, otherwise you end up going to the, the other extreme. There's some, there'll be a good graph online if you search for, um, say, excess air versus efficiency for a boiler, and you'll see that you, def, you, you need enough air to, to have complete combustion, but you don't want too much as well. Converting to a smart meter, is this a retailer's responsibility? It is if you ask them to do it. Yeah. I was just going to answer that actually. Um, so yes, the retailers are rolling out smart meters progressively across the country, but we're up to about 90, 95%, I think, penetration, something like that. It's really high anyway. Um, so if you haven't got a smart meter yet, chances are the retailers maybe have stopped deploying in that area. Um, so if you want a smart meter, you can probably get one, but you'd have to request that from your retailer and there'll be a cost associated with that. But it's not, I don't know what the current charges are, but it's not a huge amount. Um, yeah, but yeah, you pick that up with you. You'd have to pick that up with your retailer. Cool. And then last question we've got from Terry. Uh, he's worried about the sunk cost of the condensing gas boiler at the pool. It's only three years old. Is there a market for secondhand condensing gas boilers, or will that be a write-off? Um, it's a it's a tricky question because even if you replace the gas boiler and sell it to someone else, then I guess the carbon emissions are still coming from somewhere. It's just not coming from you, right? So. Ideally, you would scrap that in terms of carbon emissions, but obviously there's, there's financials to consider as well. Um, it becomes, I guess, a bit of a, more of a philosophical problem somewhat. But yeah, um, I think there would be a market for secondhand condensing gas boilers. Whether, yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. We ideally want to get rid of it entirely. Um, obviously, there's some asset value to it. Potentially, there might be some, um, there could be some initiatives coming from the government in the future that you can write off some of those high carbon um, high carbon assets early. Maybe maybe that's something that they consider. Um, um, who knows? So, um, and also if you are in the state sector, then there's there's funding. There's a two hundred million dollar 
um, fund that you can apply to to accelerate some of this decarbonisation. So potentially, um, yeah, potentially there are some options out there to accelerate these things along. Um, Martin's just made a good point. You could sell that secondhand boiler to someone who's burning coal. So obviously there's there's levels of carbon emissions. So a, a condensing gas boiler is still better than coal, but ideally we go to something like heat pumps or or um, electric. I think that's probably that's time. We're five o'clock. Yep, bang on. So Mike. I'm not sure if he's still here or whether he can talk or not. I'm still here, yes. You oh, think I'm, thank God. Surely you can't even possibly imagine I've fallen asleep during that uh, <laughs> wonderful presentation. Um, so it falls to me then to say thank you very much. Um, that's really interesting from my perspective, as I think most people uh, in the virtual room will know, my background is not engineering. Um, so I'm still learning significantly about some of these issues such as power factors and heat pumps and the efficiency of those. So it was great for me. Uh, I suspect it was great for everyone. So thank you all very much. There may have been one or two little questions in there that we didn't manage. Uh, and I'm seeing now some comments coming through saying thank you. Um, so hopefully that uh, you'll accept my relaying of those uh, to you gentlemen. Uh, yeah, and thanks. thanks for coming. Thanks again. Um, just a quick reminder for everyone that this is the first of several. If you have any questions related to the topics that Ben and Paul have discussed, then uh, please feel free to contact them directly. Uh, but as I said, we do have another session this, this time next week. Uh, we'll be looking in a lot more detail. And, and I think that the term these days is deep dives, isn't it? We'll be doing <laughs> a deep dive into procurement and just how you can start trying to nail down that that bill for the energy that we all have to use even if we're efficient with uh, with using it so thank you everyone for attending thank you lumen um, for guinea pigging the webinar series uh, we'll see you later on uh, with some more detailed um, webinar activity i think focused at uh, knowledgeable audiences our membership uh, and some people who are a much, a, perhaps a little bit more familiar with the nitty gritty of the, the technical and engineering details. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks, I think. Uh, but thanks everyone for coming along and hopefully we'll see you all soon. And goodbye for now. Cool. Thanks everyone else. Catch up. Enjoy your bubbles. See ya.